The plan was simple. When, there, when there's a coup in Russia, you don't upload a weekly summary. But apparently, the coup lasted 24 to 36 hours. So guess what? We're here with another weekly summary where we'll go through everything that happened in the market, or at least the highlights of everything that happened in the market. We'll talk about the craze around Bitcoin ETFs. We're going to talk about the fight that every investor is involved in. We're going to talk about, of course, the coup that was or lasted 36 hours. We're going to talk about all the specific news that came out of the stock market this week. And we're going to look at the major averages. Are you ready for it? Let's go. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the channel. I'm Micah Stocks from our channel Stock Talk with Micah Stocks, where we talk about stocks. This is our channel. We have reached already 1,800 subscribers where we have 32 videos and if you're new to the channel welcome if you're an existing if you're an existing viewer thank you very much for joining us again for another weekly summary i have no idea what the thumbnail will be this week probably something militant about everything that is happening so before we talk about that if you're new to the channel it would be great if you can subscribe up on the right and then turn notifications on so you can be notified every time I post a new weekly summary. Let's directly dive into the market. Dow Jones down 2.1% this week, S&P down 1.83, Nasdaq is down 2%, and the Russell is down 3.3%. Not a positive week for the market, but we'll see in a second. We're still green on the year. Dow up 1.78, S&P down 13.7, Nasdaq up almost 30%, and Russell up 4%. But the big story for this week, the big impact, was not the regular stock market. It was the crypto market leading the charges. Bitcoin up 14.4% with huge volume. We're going to talk about the reasons for that in a second. ETH up 8.6%. And this bring, brings both of these coins to 84 and 57% up for the year. Don't worry, we'll mention why. And when we talk about the U.S. sectors, healthcare woke up and was the only green sector for the week. The poorest performer is real estate. A lot of pressure around Powell keep talking, that keeps saying on the Hill, it was there Wednesday and Thursday, that there will be two more rate hikes during the year. But as a contrarian view to real estate, home builders is the best sub uh, in, the, in the market, subsector, sorry, up 1.86%. But on the other hand, when everyone talks about increasing rates, regional banks are down 7.2%. That brings us to the news for this week. Now, as I mentioned in the, in the intro in the beginning, I wasn't even plan, planning to do a weekly summary, maybe a summary of everything that happens in Russia. But apparently in the last few hours, a lot of things happen there. But if we summarize everything, if you've not listened to the news, one of the groups that's fighting for Russia against Ukraine, which is called Wagner or Wagner Group, has decided to turn from the Ukrainian war back to Russia and maybe, maybe try to overthrow Putin. But apparently it went very well. They got, in, they got into Moscow. And then they stopped. And the president of Belarus, about 2 p.m. Eastern uh, on Saturday, June 24th, updated that between Prigozhin, which is the leader for Wagner Group, and Putin, who's the president of Russia, they came to an agreement that Prigozhin would leave Russia and go to Belarus. Wagner fighters who didn't take part in the uprising will sign, a, will sign their contract with the Ministry of Defense, meaning they're going to get their mercenaries, so they're getting paid for uh, fighting the Ukraine war. Wagner fighters who did take part will not be charged, any criminal charge against them, but no one knows if the Ministry of Defense leadership is going to change. Behind the scene, that was one of the requests or one of the things that Prigozhin went to fight for, but I have no idea what will happen there. He's going to be in Belarus, so we'll know if he will. What else happened this, this week? So I talked about Bitcoin at the beginning. 
This is, and thanks to Kubishi letter, these are all the things that happened in the last two weeks. Binance and, Binance and Coinbase are being sued by the SEC. U.S. dollar deposits is suspended at Binance. Fed stops raising rates. Fa France accuses Binance of money laundering. And then comes the good part. BlackRock files for a Bitcoin ETF. Citadel, Fidelity, and Charles Schwab launch their new crypto exchange. Wisdom Tree and Invesco launches, or actually all of them file to launch a Bitcoin ETF. And Bitcoin hits the $30,000 mark. Now, Statistically speaking, BlackRock does not get denied once they ask for a Bitcoin ETF. Same for Invesco. Invesco is the one that runs QQQ and others. They do not get denied when they file for a Bitcoin ETF. Was all the shake of Bitcoin down to 15,000? Was it all meant for the big institutions to load up the boat and have enough Bitcoin so they can launch a Bitcoin ETF? I know what I think, but we will see about that. So in the next few weeks, they probably will hear a lot more. Now, the reason why Bitcoin is up, it's pretty easy to understand. If now institutions, big institutions can start adding Bitcoin as an, as an ETF to their allocation, why don't they allocate 1%, maybe 2% of Bitcoin? Keep it in your portfolio. Why not? This is not financial advice. I remind everyone this is only for educational purposes and uh, entertainment, of course. But if people have that in their portfolio and they didn't have it before because it wasn't regulated in a way in an ETF style, then now it adds more demand. But Bitcoin has an X amount of coins. It cannot be mined with more coins than existing, which means that there will be more demand on a fixed supply. Anyone that learned Econ 101 knows that that means the price will increase. And that is the reason why prices increased. Now you know why we got 30,000. Let's continue to the floodgate. This is how every Bitcoin maximalist see the situation. There's a, there's a dam that's almost going to be broken down by all the demand. Will it happen? We will see. And this is Cameron Winkle, Winklevoss that says the great accumulation of Bitcoin has begun. If you are, as he's saying it, right? Anyone watching the flurry of ETFs filing understands the window to purchase a pre-IPO Bitcoin before ETF goes live is now. Meaning he sees the Bitcoin launch as like a company that's going, IP, that's going public. If you have the opportunity to buy it during, before the IPO, you will probably make a lot of money, at least in his mind. Don't take that as a financial advice. He is, he is behind Gemini platform. He wants Bitcoin to go up. He makes money when Bitcoin goes up. But I see why he means what he means. So that's Cameron. Another thing, which is not really related to the stock market, but it does show us that sometimes we should ask ourselves, are we really doing the right due diligence? A submarine with five passengers, if I'm not mistaken, four or five passengers went down to the Titanic to see the, the, to see the Titanic from, uh, from underwater and did not stand probably the pressure. All the passengers died after everyone hoped that they survived. All the information we have in the background shows us that there was lack of seriousness in building that submarine with a lot, a lot of uh, warning signs, which everyone disregarded. So how is it related to the stock market? Sometimes in stocks that we own, in companies that we own, there are a lot of warning signs and we're like, eh, OK, it's going to be OK. Well. It's not. Just saying. And this, this is the most cra crazy thing that happened this week. Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, which is owned by a company called Meta, which is also Facebook, have decided to launch their version of Twitter. Elon Musk, in a fury, said to Mark Zuckerberg, if that's the case, I want to fight you. I want to fight you in an octagon. Fight as in real fight, not in my company is bigger than yours. Fight, fists, everything. And everyone is talking about that. Now, do you think I'm joking? Well, I'm not. They're dead serious of fighting one another. Childish? Yeah. Dangerous? Might be. 
Why? Well, kids are kids, no matter the age. Short bets on the U.S. stock market hit $1 trillion, according to Bloomberg, which means that every, not every, but a lot of institutions are still bearish. Although the market went up the way it did, they're still bearish. They're actually even increasing their bearish bets. They're even expanding their short positions, which means that any uptick in the market will create a huge short squeeze that if this is not cleared or the market's going to fall, or a short squeeze is going to happen, happen, meaning that as we are right now, we're not really going to stay for long. And the reason why they're doing that is pretty technical. They see all these resistance spots, and every time we hit a resistance, they're increasing their short. But the problem is that the market just clears each resistance and goes up. Multiple breakouts create for the bulls the energy to keep pushing money in, to the bears to keep increasing their short positions. All this together is creating a recipe for something big to happen to both sides. I have no idea to which side, but something big is going to happen with this amount of short interest. Not doing anything is not going to be the solution. And when you look at what are the options, well, if we were back at 2007, we would keep going down. If we were, and thanks to Charlie Bilal for that, of course, if we were at the dot-com era, we would keep going down, but we are not. As you can see, these are charts starting at the same starting point, showing the drop down and then the recovery, which none of these bear markets had that fast. So are we in the same situation? I know my thought around that, but you know, everyone has their own feeling. One point, a one trillion dollar believes different than me, but who knows? The week was so long, we can't even remember that Blinken flew to China to meet President Xi. Two days later, Biden called President Xi a dictator. Apparently, the meeting went well, if that's how he called him afterwards. And if we're talking about China, China extends the tax break for new energy vehicles until 2027, breaking it between 2025, which has the most uh, tax breaks, and then 2025 to 2027. Half of it, this is very good. <clears throat> if you're a Tesla owner, a NEO owner, an XPV, any stock that's related to energy vehicles, or EV in R, the way we call it. And if you're an owner of a NEO stock, you probably have seen it coming down. The reason is they needed capital injection, which they got from the Abu Dhabi uh, government. Is it good? Is it bad? It's just a fact, meaning that they needed capital injection, which is usually not that good. Elon Musk met President, uh, Prime Minister Moody, Prime Minister of India, this week in New York and promised he will do whatever he can, Elon Musk promised, to open a factory in India, which means that we might have a new gigafactory after Mexico in India. This is a great sign because it means that Tesla is speeding up to create that low-cost car around $25,000 because in India selling the regular Model 3, Model Y is one, the cars are too big, two, they're too expensive, at least from what I know. Rivian joins GM and Ford and replaces their charging connectors into the NC, NACS, North America Charging uh, System, which is the Tesla charging system, and they plan on doing that as soon as spring 2024. Hyundai is still uh, considering, probably they also will. Carl Gantinia brings us an article from Barron's that says that take it to the bank why there won't be a recession in 2023. The reason why is that we are in the early stages of a manufacturing super cycle. And uh, that means that industrial stocks and other stock will keep going up. Again, according to Barron's, the, are they right or wrong? It, we will see. Alibaba ticker Baba has changed their CEO from Daniel Zhang to Eddie Wu. That is part of their restructuring and splitting the company into several divisions that would be a company by their own and have their own IP and do their own IPO, go public and raise money. Uh, that's part of the transitions going on there. And Charlie Bilello, which we saw earlier, also shows us that shipping costs have dropped dramatically by 88% from their peak. And we are now at levels lower than 2019. Crazy statistics. PayPal 
sold their European buy now, pay later um, business to KKR, which is an, a private investment firm. And PayPal will still enjoy the recognition while KKR will enjoy the money coming out of these uh, transactions and the payments. And Harvard, Harvard is implementing in their computer science 5.0 course AI. They're going to teach the students about OpenAI, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 models. Everyone is implementing that this way or another and they're very close, Harvard, to a one-on-one -on -one teacher to student ratio by having ChatGPT. What else? What else is happening? Yeah, I'm looking down because I have a pedal that I'm moving the slides from. ARK Invest during the week, selling Tesla stocks while buying Robinhood stock. You're probably saying, oh, that means they don't believe in Tesla anymore. Well, that's not the case. Looking back at ARK's holding, ARK does not, at least according to their principles, do not like to be over 10% weight of one stock. In this case, due to the more than 100% increase in Tesla stock value during the year, 108%, they need to keep reducing their position and that's why they, they are selling. Why are they buying Robinhood uh, instead? They might see the opportunity there. Ford preparing another round of layoffs. Fed Bostic op upon, oppose, opposite to uh, Powell, which keeps saying that we're going to raise rates at least two more times. He's saying maybe no more rates are needed this year. Citibank calls everyone into the office. They're going to they are telling their managers that they're going to face consequences if they don't comply with the policies, meaning they're going to be fired. Let's call it as it is. Amazon Prime Day, July 11th and July 12th, two days of Prime Day. Charge point. Ticker CHPT reminds everyone, we also have the North American charging system, the NACS capabilities. We also have fast, fast charging. Stop selling our stock. That's what they're telling everyone. Katie Jones from Charles Schwab updates us about the jobless claims and says that it came the same as week before. Powell probably didn't like that. And Google. Google filed a complaint with the FTC accusing Microsoft of anti-competitive cloud practice. Well, if you can't fight them, sue them, at least according to Google. That's, it's, it didn't really impact none of the stocks, of course. Apple announced the availability of their software tools for the Apple Vision Pro. You can write in the comments below if you plan on purchasing the 3500 Apple Vision Pro and start using it. What else did we have? Micron is investing $2.75 billion in a new assembly plant in India. And last but not least, Larry Fink from BlackRock says the investors do not have appetite anymore to invest in China. They prefer investing in Japan. Those were all the headlines for this week. And that brings us directly to next week. These are the companies that are going to report next week. On Monday morning, before the bell, we are going to see Carnival Cruise, ticker CCL, almost up 100% year-to-date. But Tuesday, we're going to see Walgreens and Manchester United. Manchester United is on the verge of being uh, acquired uh, by uh, Qatar, uh, one of Qatar investment firms. We have General Mills Wednesday, Micron Wednesday after the bell, and Nike Thursday after the bell. Special events, the, may, the main two events that we have this week is Powell speaking twice, both on Wednesday afternoon and on Thursday early morning, 2.30 a.m. Eastern. And these are the charts. As we, as we do every week, we look at the S&P 500 ticker, SPY. There are other tickers, of course, that follow from Vanguard. This is VU and others. They all do the same. They track the SPX, the S&P 500. As you can see, we have changed our trend. The trend was a downward trend, and we are now in an upward trend. We are in a tunnel, in a, in a very, very defined channel going up, and we are at the upper area of that channel, which means that we might see a bit more resistance every time we push forward. It means that we need to break to the upside if we're going to go upside. We, we still have an ability to go down to around 4180, something like that. That would be a very 
healthy correction. It does not mean we're breaking anything. It does not mean, mean the trend is changing. All it means that we are providing a better entry point for a lot of people. That does not mean it's going to happen. I'm just saying that it shouldn't frighten you. And that is everything that happened this week. I was Micah Stocks. Thank you very much for joining another weekly summary. If you haven't subscribed yet, that would be a great opportunity to do that. And if you haven't smashed that like button, please do. I will see you again next week. Same time, same place. Have a great week. Bye-bye.